I've always felt like you had a very uh, interesting story, very interesting person. Uh, very, you're a very, very sweet uh, person, I have to say. You know, very, very kind-hearted. And uh, I was very drawn to you from, you know, the very beginning when I first met you. And we kind of, you know, stayed friends. You supported me kind of through, you know, the radio show and all of that. And I thought, you know, it's funny that I have. Stop there. Okay, great. Um, it's funny how I meet friends, and then I never really think about, oh, I should have them, you know, come on and talk about, you know, their uh, experiences. But you had a book that came out, and when I heard about, you know, how this went from, you know, a fiction to a nonfiction book, uh, and the story behind it was so interesting, I couldn't, you know, wait to ask and have you on the show. So I appreciate you so much for coming on the show tonight. What I'm going to do is uh, get the update from Todd, have you listen in, and then as soon as we get done with that, then uh, we'll go ahead and continue on with uh, your interview. Is that okay? Oh, sure, sure. It's just a pleasure, and I'm grateful uh, for you for having me. And, uh, yeah, just uh, let me know, you know. <laughs> great, great. Well, you'll be on the line with us the whole time. So, you know, if you have any questions for Todd or anything like that or you want to jump in and ask anything or comment, Feel free to do so. We're not going to mute you or anything, so you'll be live on air with us. So, um, okay. we're very happy to have you. All right, uh, Todd, are you there? I am, Christina. How are you? I'm good. See, I told you this this live, you know, uh, doing this live radio and, and doing the types of shows I do. I swear, it never fails that you know something right as a time for us to go on, something <laughs> happens. <laughs> and surprises is, is what life is about. It makes it fun. Oh. Absolutely. I mean, at the beginning, the Easter, it really is normal. I'm, I'm with you all the way yeah. on that. All right. Well, it's great to have you back. Uh, actually, both of you, man, because we had to last week, unfortunately, our uh, beautiful producer, Tiffany, and the network, uh, one of the network owners, uh, was ill last uh, Monday and kind of came on last minute. She was hoping she'd be able to make it, you know, through for the show and just was not able to. And, you know, I, I will have to say one thing is that our network is so absolutely amazing. They stick behind us. It, 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 even though it's a big network, we've got a lot of hosts, a lot of shows. Um, it is like a family, and we're very, very close-knit. And if I am to call or I have a personal emergency, my guests may have a personal emergency. Things happen because this is live, you know, uh, radio. We don't know when something might happen or, you know, the network goes down or they're having a storm, you know, in New York that takes out, you know, our network. We never know what might happen, but they're always so good about working around whatever situation comes about. And so for, you know, them to come to me and say, hey, you know, Tiffany's ill, you know, is there any way we could do a rerun? Um, as much as I know many people were looking forward to the show with both of you men, uh, I as well feel that, you know, family and health comes first, and I was glad that both of you were um, you know, on the same page as well and had no problem rescheduling. So thank you both for, you know, uh, agreeing to do that. Absolutely. Oh, it was no problem, really. I mean, I waited uh, like four years, so one more week really wasn't a big uh, big pushover for me, so, you know. <laughs> but, uh, there you go, true. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm just grateful to be here now, so, you know. All right, um, perfect. Well, so um, for those who don't know, and, uh, or, and many probably do know Todd by this point because we've been having him actually come on for the last month or so, uh, to talk about his project that he's doing, the Afterlife Files, and uh, the Kickstarter campaign that he was doing to fund it. We've been having him come to give us updates uh, weekly, and because last week we had to reschedule it, we had him come on Aliens, UFOs, and Beyond, my other show, uh, to give us an update. So we're back today because there is only one week left in this campaign. So we really got push this and interesting enough uh, it jumped like five thousand dollars you know of donations just over you know the last few days uh, since the last time you were uh, on the other show so that was you know uh interesting but it's still far off from where we need it to be correct 
Oh, yeah, that, absolutely right. Yeah, we, we've definitely had some momentum in the last few days, gone up by a few thousand dollars. But uh, nevertheless, as, as we've discussed, uh, we have a very ambitious goal of uh, – Five hundred thousand uh, dollars in order to meet our goal on, on Kickstarter, and Kickstarter is a crowdfunding platform that's an all-or-nothing type situation. So, um, if by the end of your campaign, and our campaign ends in about six days, sort of uh, the very early morning of March nine, if you're on the on the Pacific Coast, and uh, the very late hours of March eight, if you're on the East Coast. Uh, so that's when our campaign ends, and if we um, don't have, if we haven't uh, reached the 500,000 by that time, it just means that the campaign didn't succeed, and uh, all of the nice people who made pledges on their credit cards, no money will change hands because uh, uh, the money uh, doesn't fund the project unless you actually meet your goal. That's one of the distinguishing things of Kickstarter. So um, we've got, uh, we're about 150th there. <laughs> Uh, so we'll have to see. I, I am an optimist, but um, uh, on the very first time you had me on the show, Christina, you said, well, what if you don't reach your goal, which was a very prescient question. Right. And, uh, and we had talked about that uh, the fact that uh, there, one way or another this project is going to get done. Um, um, it's sort of uh, one of the missions of my life, and uh, already uh, I'm thinking about uh, Plan B, Plan C, and Plan D, if Plan A doesn't happen, but we've got six Correct. days, and you never know. Uh, so uh, we're we're hoping that uh, some of the folks listening will, uh, uh, when they hear more about the project, and they go to the Kickstarter page and they look at Afterlife Files. It's very easy. You just go to Kickstarter.com. There's a search box at the top. Type in Afterlife Files, and it'll come right up. And uh, you should just watch the video on the top of the page, the video trailer. It's about eight minutes, and it'll tell you really everything you need to know about what we want to accomplish and why. And then there's plenty more information on the page and fun prizes we're giving out. And so uh, if folks are interested, we urge them to go do it and tell their friends and their acquaintances and, and their enemies, everybody. Let's, let's get some uh, pledges. Enemies, <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, the thing is, too, I have put the link out. If you go to any of my pages across social media, uh, Google+, Plus, like in any of, any of those across the board, you will see um, a, the promo video plus the link uh, will take you directly to the site to donate and, and look people. You can donate as little as a dollar. That's right. So, you know, again, we I keep saying this over and over and over. We know that, you know, this show on average has over 100,000 live listeners every week. If everybody would just go and pledge one dollar, you know, look how quickly, you know, it could jump, you know, a campaign like this, you know, incredibly high. And, again, it's no harm to thought. If it doesn't go through, then it's, you know, you're not going to be charged for it. But, again, I think that for people in the paranormal field, you know, we've been looking for a show that could be out there that we could, you know, see everybody loves EVPs and something that was not really per se where the network had all the control and it made it, you know, all about just for ratings and, you know, you could fake some stuff, put it in there. You know, this is not what this is about. And, and Todd, I really want you to kind of, you know, give a rundown for people who might not understand, you know, what exactly the Afterlife Files is going to be about so that, you know, they can really understand, like, this is something that, you know, has not been, per se, touched in our field. And, you know, we've got so many, you know, per se, quote-unquote, ghost hunting shows. Uh, I think that something like this is great. And they're looking at not so much the networks, but through the web series, through Hulu, through, you know, um, Google Play, you know, Amazon uh, Play, all those different um, web-based and uh, subscription-based type uh, platforms where you would be able to see it around the world, so not just, you know, where we're at. So go go ahead, Todd, and, and tell me a little bit about what your idea is and what your vision is. Sure, Christina, and thank you so much, and, and thank you for your support. Yeah, uh, what we're seeking to do is, uh, I guess you could call it the mother of all EVP experiments. Um, when 
Excuse me, I was about to sneeze. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, that's live radio. I've probably blown out the ears of all of your listeners. I'm sorry about that. Um, at any rate, um, we, we like to be spontaneous here at the Afterlife uh, Files, too. That's right. um, and um, uh, what the Afterlife Files really is, is uh, to take the, this uh, great potential that EVP seems to have. I mean, uh, EVP is, as an active area of research has been around since the 1950s. And it's grown to the point where you have uh, paranormal investigators and ghost hunters all over the world and associations. And you look at their websites, uh, very often they'll have uh, what are called Class A EVPs posted. That is, uh, uh, what appear to be voices that they've gotten in certain circumstances that are so clear that several people listening without any being told what it is would agree that it's saying the same thing. And many of these people feel that it could be evidence of life after death, that our consciousness continues in some other form, and it just hasn't been proven yet, and we may be able to establish communication channels. So with all of this amazing audio evidence and also video evidence that's come through called ITC, Instrumental Transcommunication, you kind of wonder why it hasn't really hit the mainstream consciousness, the mainstream media, except for maybe a little story around Halloween here and there and those cable shows about ghost hunting that you talked about that are entertaining, but a lot of people who are actually in the field aren't too crazy about that. And the reason we think it is is that so far – no one has really been able to get mainstream, uh, well-known scientists, people like electronic engineers, speech forensics people, involved in helping design the most controlled, uh, tightest type of experiment ever into EVP, something that completely eliminates the possibility of tampering of errant radio waves, of TV waves that could be misinterpreted. And so what the Afterlife Files is about is raising money so that we can hire these experts, uh, presumably people who have never even considered anything about the paranormal and are probably very skeptical, match them up on a design team with some people who are very experienced in EVP. Uh, also, we might have a couple of families that may have recently lost a loved one and are seeking to communicate. It will be a very unique design team. And at the same time that it's a scientific investigation, it will be a 13-episode reality show that documents every moment from the moment that the, the team is recruited and they're put together and they presumably argue because you're going to have skeptics together with paranormal investigators. It'll be very interesting, but all the way through the experiment. And the reason that we're seeking to raise what seems like an ungodly amount of money, $500,000, is that we want to be able to have control ourselves rather than go to the cable stations or networks and come up with something that is going to be a lot more commercial but not do the quality study, scientific study, that we think this material deserves. And so more than half of the money we raise will go to uh, uh, hiring these scientists at rates that they'll feel comfortable with convincing them of the integrity of what we're doing, that we will not misrepresent them. If they're skeptics, we'll make it clear that they're skeptics. And uh, either purchasing or leasing the most sensitive uh, audio and video equipment possible uh, to either get the use of or even construct large Faraday anechoic chamber type things that would shield all of the recording equipment from any noise, uh, radio waves, TV waves, anything that could cause false results. And so really the afterlife file is a duality. It is both um, the most ambitious and hopefully decisive scientific investigation and expedition ever taken of EVP and ITC and a reality show that will make it all transparent and show everything from the very beginning. So it's an exciting concept and really needs to be done. And when we talk to it and uh, talk about it and to people like you and people who listen to your show, people instantly understand what the implications are if we're successful and have been supporting us. But uh, we obviously need a lot more people out there. The, uh, our video that's on our Kickstarter page needs to go viral in the next six days if we're to have a chance of success. And we really appreciate people like you and so many others for being so supportive. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think that, like, 
so many things come out that it's really kind of the the people who really persevere of pushing it. So, which is why I didn't, you know, assume that it, you know, you wouldn't be able to make that. I told you the very first time I uh, brought you on that, you know, I actually realized that that is not a whole lot of money for what you're trying to put together on the scale that you're trying to put it together. Um, but I am, you know, really glad to, you know, know that no matter what happens with this one, you know, um, that the project will still go forward and, you know, regroup and, you know, uh, possibly go on, as you said, maybe a, on a different platform where um, any donations that you receive or, you know, you get and then you can start at least putting things in action maybe so uh you know a lot of different options you know michael what do you think about uh what todd's trying to put together i think it's a, a tremendous uh, great idea um thank you basically uh i agree with him that the uh if he went with to try to do what he's doing and go on the air with um uh, some cable company they would you know, probably charge a lot more where if he wants to be independent and have control of everything um, so he gets a positive result from his findings, um, I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, that, it's, that's uh, so true. You know, the, the cable companies or networks, I mean, uh, I mean, God bless them. They, they have a business, but they also have very commercial uh, motivations, and sometimes the, what comes out is so different from what goes in. Um, uh, sausage, but worse is is how I would characterize it. That, that's true. That's true. I'm so grateful for Christina because uh, some other radio uh, stations that I called just to get on the air, they wanted to charge me two thousand dollars just to come on the air with them. Oh. So, you know, I it was just understand like understand that you know. Oh like, yeah. What yeah, is they a person ego? I, I mean, now you know, and I hate to say because, like, again, I know a lot of mm. radio show hosts. Again, that's why I really have enjoyed. This is not the first network that I've been with, um, but I have loved it here at DPM because, you know, everybody does, you know, uh, get along. Everybody uh, are very good to each other. They support each other, you know, all the things that you think that, you know, um, the way it should be. But I see so many people that they're so ego-driven that they feel like, okay, if, you know, I've got a lot of people listening to my show, now I, you know, should demand money or, you know, for people to come on. I would just tell anybody, especially you, Michael, anybody out there, any host that wants to charge you to come on their show, don't turn and run as far away from those kind of shows as you possibly can because, and that's just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, if you want to to help get you know uh, the word out, then I know plenty of you know show hosts that are are friends of mine that I help to help to get you interviews on. So um, you know, don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> that's very nice to know. <laughs> and um, um, no, I think Todd's idea is, is good. I mean. The, the more we investigate or the more shows like yours that people can come on the air and then tell the real stories and people really take a good sincerity about their story rather than just think it's too far fetched. Oh, this guy's nuts. Um, you know, he, he wants us to believe that, you know, but the thing is when somebody has the proof, they should really uh, give the person a chance to state their story and make a, um, uh, a point of it, you know, that, Something really unique has been accomplished, you know. <laughs> right, yeah, right. Yeah, there's so many nice people out there. That's one thing that I, I found. I, I was prepared to meet a lot of nice people and, and talk to a lot of nice people, but uh, I've been pleasantly surprised even over those uh, positive expectations. Uh, uh, when you talk to people like you, Christina, or paranormal investigators throughout the world, and people have been reaching out to me, it's amazing how many of these people um, um, just uh, do work because they want to help others. They don't accept any payment for it. Um, mm -hmm. They they actually will reach into their own pockets and and buy their own equipment just so they can do that. And uh, um, I was sort of aware of that, but I, this made me much more conscious of 
uh, the everyday good deeds that are being done just because people, A, want to help other people, and B, they just have that, that, that innate curiosity that all humans have about what really happens to us when we die and what happens to our loved ones. And uh, uh, they want to, they're hoping, of course, that maybe uh, there is consciousness that continues after uh, physical death. As you know, I'm kind of a skeptic about these things, and that's why I have the scientific approach. But they're after, you know, the same kind of scientific proof, and, and they fundamentally want to help others. And what a great thing to learn about people, that uh, there are so many nice people out there. So it's been a good experience. Well, something else I liked about you, Todd, was that, you know, you have been a, an attorney for a very long time, used to be a prosecutor. And when you were bringing forth, and because you're a skeptic on, you know, these kind of things, you wanted to be able to bring forward evidence that would stand you know, to the same type of evidence you would need to bring if you were bringing forth a, a criminal case, you were prosecuting a criminal case, and you wanted to prove that something had actually happened. So if you want to prove that, you know, um, there are EVP, you know, these EVPs are all these different things, then, you know, of course, you're going to want to bring a standard of evidence, you know, uh, very high. Because anybody could just say, okay, you know, here's an EVP, and we've all, as investigators, and even people who aren't investigators, we've we've seen it many, many times where we'll see a show and they'll say, uh, oh yeah, they got an, you know, an EVP, and it'll say like, you know, I want it wants to kill you or die or something, you know, some craziness, you know, and everybody that's sitting there listening to the show, they're all kind of like squinting, trying to like listen, and they'll like rewind it, try to listen again. And it doesn't sound like, oh, we, we're going to kill you or anything like that. Everybody has a different opinion of what it's saying. So when we're talking about, you know, um, bringing evidence forth on a much different level uh, and degree of, of authenticity, and we are bringing forward Class A EVPs that are, you know, uh, you have no problem being able to distinguish what's being said, you know, that makes a big difference. And it is a very, very, you know, uh, interesting piece of evidence to bring forward and, and Christina, if, if i could uh, if i yeah, could step yeah. in for a minute um that's what you're talking about is exactly what um i went through recording i was trying to leave a trail so i made a video of my book uh what happened everything and while i was recording in my garage where i'm where I'm at right now, as a matter of fact, because I have a small house and I have like two kids inside, dog, cat, and <laughs> how that is. Um, but anyways, when I was recording that, I my uh, computer started to get fuzzy, and because I've got paranormal here in my house, on and off, right. not all the time. Of course. Uh, but but the thing is, I didn't even know it. So when I went to go listen to my recording, and I had. Um, uh, I, I wanted to really listen to it. I put the headphones on because the kids were making noise and stuff, and I could hear it better. Then, at the same time, my my screen went a little like snowy. There was this voice that came on, and I still have it recorded, so I'll send it to you. You can check it out, and if God wants to check it out, cool, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, you can clearly state that this voice wasn't saying like I'm after you or anything like that but this voice was just pure evil I mean it, it, when I listened to it and, and there's another paranormal ex, uh, person I know out there and I already sent that to her she, and she you know listened to it and um, the thing is these things really do happen and uh, paranormal happens um um I'm, my story just basically relates to forensics, too, just like Todd was talking. He'd like to hire some forensic experts. Todd, that's exactly what I had to do, buddy, <laughs> because when in uh, 2009, when I wrote this short story, September 11, 2009, um, I would meditate for a long time, and then, and then I got this story to write, like a vision and a command to write it, like, and I think it was my Holy Spirit because I'm a Christian guy, but I'm not... I'm just saying this is what I think happened, and my Holy Spirit allowed me to see into the future, told me the story what to write, and I wrote it down, and I put my family in there, my kids' names, my wife's names as characters in my short story. So make the story short, what I wrote in ink pen, thank God, 
uh, in a composition book. All my pages are still attached in the book. Um, I, my dog, uh, Maggie, who's still alive, would run out the door because it's fenced in and chase, chase the birds off the ground. And uh, there was a whole bunch of blackbirds in the yard one time. And mysteriously, these couple birds came back and tried to attack her. And I'm going, huh, how can I make a, well, that was weird. Maybe I'll use, like, blackbirds. But I don't want to copy the Alfred Hitchcock movie at all. So what could I, you know, so I sat out there in the backyard for a couple hours. I know it seems like a long time, but I really get into my meditation process. Uh, But anyways, I came up with the thing of um, having... Uh, Blackbird start off my chapter, my first chapter of my story. So, so make make my story sort of short. What I wrote in my short story, I started my short story opening on December thirty first, twenty eleven. At the time, it was <laughs> September eleventh, two thousand nine. Um, but I wanted to sort of in two thousand nine. There, the big thing was the end of the earth coming. The Mayans wrote about about it, you know, the end of the earth, the end of the world, 2012. Well, I knew I wanted to start my short story before uh, January 1st, 2012. I had to have something strange happen December 31st, 2011, one day before it went in it. So I got this vision that this was going to transpire, like, and I had blackbirds um, flying overhead and at that time, I was watching the sun come up in my short story with a black streak running through it, and I thought it was strange. So I grabbed my binoculars and try to focus. And all of a sudden, I hear all these flapping of wings, and I look up in the sky, and here these blackbirds are fighting each other, and, and they're falling to the ground, and they're gasping for air, and their tongues are hanging out. And I'm going, and then they're attacking my dog Maggie, and, you know, and all this in my short story. And that's exactly what happened December 31st, 2011 in BB, Arkansas, 100 miles down the street. Well, wow. yeah, yeah. But now listen to this. It first occurred 15 months before, I mean, uh, 15 months after I wrote my short story. I wrote my short story from September 11, 2009 until October uh, 31st, 2009, about a month and a half or something. I, I wrote the short story. Well, December 31st, 2010, remember my short story opens December 31st, 2011, but December 31st, 2010, the blackbirds fell dead in BB, Arkansas. And when I was watching, uh, watching Robin Mead on CNN news in the morning and I just couldn't believe because I was watching, she goes, for some mysterious reasons, blackbirds, now this is December 31st, 2010, for some mysterious reason, blackbirds are falling from the sky in BB, Arkansas. And I just sat down, woke up, just taking a sip of my coffee. I spit my coffee up because I'm going, hey, that's my short story. I just, I just wrote that, right. I just wrote that 15 months earlier. This is unbelievable, right? So I'm going to my wife, Anita. I'm going, Anita, get in here, get in here, look at the TV. What I wrote about in that short story just happened in BB, Arkansas, 100 miles down the street. She goes, no way. And I said, yes, way. look at the TV, you know. So she comes running over, and, and she, you know, her mouth was open and all that. You know, couldn't believe it. So um, she said to me pretty strongly, you know, don't because we're Baptist Christians. We go to church. And so she says, don't say anything about this now, Michael. I know you like to talk and stuff, but don't say anything to our congregation or anything because they're going to think we're, like, weird or something, you know. Right. And so right. I thought about it. I thought about it, and I didn't get um, – uh, so anyways, when that happened, I, I'm going, man, in my short story, because I was in shock, because it was 15 months after I wrote it, so I'm going, did I put December 31st, 2010, the Blackbirds fell, or did I put December 31st, 2011? So I ran back in my uh, chest, in my bedroom to the bottom drawer of my chester, got the book out, and I'm looking at it, and it goes, December 31st, 2011. I'm going, oh, dang it. I said, man, I missed it by one year, you know, and... Uh, so, anyways, I was still in shock for a good six, seven months. Um, so, finally, when I'm starting to get over it, right, around, completely around October of um, 2010 or so, here comes December, now, um, 31st, 2011. Now, I just about put away 
the whole thing of the Blackbirds Falling Dead, the whole story, because I thought I'd just go on with my life. And since my wife told me not to tell anybody, I didn't, and I just kept it to myself. But now here comes December 31st, 2011. I'm sitting in the exact same spot, getting up at the exact same time, and then Robin Mead once again says, for some mysterious reasons, blackbirds have fallen dead to the ground uh, two years in a row now. And I knew, inst- I knew instantly it turned my book from fiction into nonfiction in reality. You know, I mean, I even got the climate conditions correct. You know, I said it was like, I don't know, going to be in the low 70s, and it was. So, um, now when you got, when you said you were able to obtain some, some EVP, uh, yeah. what, what were you able to obtain? Oh, you mean, are you talking about from my recording when the voice came on? Mm-hmm. Or just any of the EVPs you said you had, you know, been able to obtain some EVP evidence over time? Well, the, oh yeah, the, the the evidence I only have as far as that is on my, uh, excuse me, on the uh, videos I made on my book. Um, however, um, the other during my writings of me writing the book back in 2009, I even went through some paranormal stuff. When I first got this duplex, it has a big bright red door, and. It always said on there for rent, for rent, for rent. And I'm just going, well, I'm going to check this place out. So I got the key, you know, from the company, came and checked it out. And I opened up the front door and right away. I get these, I'm very good at like knowing and getting these feelings of something's there, something's not there. I've had it since I was a disability, since I was like six, six years old. But anyways, I didn't really feel that good about opening the door. But I opened the door anyway, it was like, I don't know, 102 out, I guess, that day. Make the story short, it was really cold in the family room. Well, there's no furniture in it, so that's probably normal, the marble floor. Right. And um, But as I walked through the hall, I noticed some different cold spots on and off, you know, in, in the hallway. And I go to just to look at the bathroom, what the bathroom looked like. I flip the light on. <laughs> right away, what happens? The light comes on bright, then it starts to flicker. And I'm going, oh, no, this place needs light bulbs, too, you know. Uh, not thinking anything about paranormal at that point, but a little bit. I felt uneasy a little bit, you know. Um, then when I went to the backyard, some people just moved out of the place like two weeks earlier. I look in the backyard, and underneath the master bedroom window, here's chopped up particles of glass about three feet wide and about two feet high. I'm saying to myself, why would a person put chopped up glass, and here the window wasn't even broken, you know. Why would a person put chopped up glass underneath their master window? Like, it, w- it was just really odd. So that struck with me. Well, um, after I would say two weeks of us in here, being in here, I started to hear a kid playing in the hall, like kids' voices. Now, I have a couple of kids, but I mean, this is like late at night, they're sleeping. And I'm going, man, am I hearing things or what? What's going on with these? I'm hearing kids down the hall. And. I didn't say nothing to my wife because we just moved in. But then about a week later, my wife goes, honey, do you hear a kid down ever laughing down the hall? I, uh, I was just like, oh, my God, you heard it too? I'm, I'm not going crazy, you know. My own wife heard it. All right. I was happy because I wasn't going crazy. She really heard it, yeah. Um, yeah you got validation. Isn't it exactly. crazy how we, how we all, you know, will hear something. We know that we've heard something, but we're so concerned about what other people will, you know, will think, you know, if we're saying that we hear something that they don't hear, that we are, you know, when we finally hear from somebody around us that, you know, they'll come out and say, oh, did you hear that? You're like, oh, you jump at the chance to, to say all that. Now, Todd, real quick uh, with you, because I know we only have a short, for a short period of time, too, but um, you actually had gotten uh, for this project a lot of, you know, very interesting EVPs along the way. I know that uh, you sent uh, some of the, um, a few of the, the ones that you had gotten, and I don't think I was trying to listen to it before, and I don't know that over my phone through the computer that your people will be able to hear the quality well. So, uh, with your permission, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I downloaded the links, and I'm going to um, include them underneath the social media post that I uh, just uh, posted for the this last campaign. Uh, sure. And I want people to take you know a listen to these EVPs, and you know along with 
Todd's video because it really kind of, you know, gives an idea of, you know, what he's trying to pull together. And, again, you know, it's not just getting a bunch of, you know, paranormal investigators together. I mean, he's really bringing, you know, the paranormal field of the investigative side together with the scientific side, you know, to bring those two together, which is really what we need because science has really kind of turned their back on, you know, uh, what we do and, and what we believe in. And uh, so this is this is something that could, you know, turn out really, really well, I think. So I definitely want to, uh, you know, wish you the continued luck. No matter, you know, what goes forward, you've got uh, my support and uh, whatever, you know, you choose to do from here, just keep me updated and, you know, definitely the door is always open to help you promote, you know, uh, any parts of this along the way till it's finally completed and ready to go. That's great, Christine. I absolutely will. And it sounds like you have a very interesting show ahead, but uh, I really appreciate your bringing me on for uh, an update. And uh, absolutely, it's uh, if if folks are uh, if their attention is sort of peaked, then uh, the best thing they could do is to follow your links or just go to Kickstarter.com, uh, put Afterlife Files in the box, watch the video. Um, there's uh, the EVPs that you talked about that we actually got during production of the trailer uh, for the Afterlife Files. Um, some of them are actually on the main trailer. But there's also, a little further down the page, another 50-second trailer, which just has a bunch of EVPs that we obtained during the course of uh, production. So people can kind of see what we're after and uh, what kind of fun prizes they can get for different levels of support. And, and as you said, you have uh, uh, at any one time perhaps at least, if not more, 100,000 listeners. And if every single one of them uh, did something unusual and said, look, I'm going to give $5 to the Afterlife Files on my credit card, well, then tomorrow we'll be there, and we can start production and start putting our scientists together. So uh, uh, I, I uh, you know, with your support and positive thoughts, you just never know. But either way, um, I'll keep you posted, and uh, uh, it sounds like Michael has a lot of interesting stuff for you. So. Uh, and, and I know you're only going to have me on for an update. So thank you very much for having me. And um, uh, and uh, I will tell you what happened. All right. And, again, uh, good luck to you, Todd. And I appreciate it. Yes, yes. And I'm going to contribute, buddy. Thank you. I appreciate it. There you that. go. See yes, you yes, I, right there. I believe everything you're doing. And, and um, it's it's on a, sort of on the same format as, like, with me. And, and Todd, if you ever – I've I had to hire some forensic scientists, so um, you never know who you're going to need. A, I never thought as an author I'd need to hire a forensic expert, but, I mean, you just never know how life is. I mean, it's great that they're there, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. If you have any suggestions for me, you know, we'll, we'll talk offline. It's uh, uh, just meeting some very interesting people. But uh, you've got a lot to tell, so I'm going to uh, let you uh, – Go on to your story, and and again, Christina, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, if you you know you're wanting to to come on, you know, again to the shows, uh, the, the Wednesday show or even next Monday show, uh, you know, for last minute updates before you know the the everything shuts off, just let me know. I will be happy to, to have you come on. And and I will let you know. Sounds good. Okay. Good luck, Tom. All right. Okay, thanks again. Okay, have a great evening, you two. Okay. You too, too, Todd. Take it easy. Thank you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Yeah, well, again, that was a good friend, Todd Moster, and he is doing the Kickstarter campaign for the Afterlife uh, Files. Very, very interesting uh, project he's got going on. So definitely uh, you can go to, like I said, any one of my pages, my Personal Facebook pages, you can go to the show Facebook page, the Google Plus, you can go to Twitter, wherever you, you know, across social media, I've got that link up with the video and the link to the page. So as Todd said, you know, just going in and putting as little, you know, it's $5, which for many people is just a cup of coffee before they go to work. You know, if you could, you know, uh, substitute that to help, you know, this out, especially in our field. I mean, this is like, 
this is something great, and he wants to include, you know, real investigators in this, along with, you know, the scientific field, and then bring forward, you know, uh, this amazing evidence. And so everybody check out that video and, and show them some support. So, all right, Michael, let's get back to your story. And I'm so sorry that we had to, I had to cut you off a little bit right in the middle, but I didn't want you to get too far into the story, uh, and then we have to stop. So it's just so interesting, you know, how it all played out. Now, I oh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, I, I, yeah. Very, what was very interesting, what I found was that, you know, I've always known that you had some psychic abilities. And I think from the very beginning when I was first talking to you, I think I did kind of a little review for you and told you something like that. But um, one of the things that's so interesting is you, you know, I absolutely feel you did have a vision, you know, and the vision that you were given, you know, you was created into your story, you know. So it's like you said, when you wrote it, you're just getting this information and you're just writing it down and the, it, you make it into a book. But how was it for you to, you know, when that moment happened that all of a sudden it happens, you know, it comes to fruition and you're like, oh, my goodness, like, is this happening? Like, what was that moment like for you? My, Well, my heart, well, the first time, <laughs> remember, it happened twice. Well, yeah, uh, that's true. Actually, actually. I'm not going to get into that right now, but a total of four consecutive years in a row, but I'll tell you the other two years later. But the, um, the thing is, uh, and before I forget it, Blackbirds died yesterday, I guess, in Tennessee. They dropped dead there for a reason. But getting back to my story, um, yes, I did get this vision, and there's no way I could have did this on my own. Absolutely no way. I, I got like six, seven things absolutely perfectly correct. Um, you know, you heard of Nostradamus. Well, a lot of his predictions were sort of, to me, sort of vague because it was like, well, three, four hundred, five hundred years from now, there's going to be an earthquake or something like that. Well, anybody could say that, you know. Um, but I, mine was right on the mark, um, and to me, it's a miracle. It's a Christian miracle. I mean, I prayed. If I if I wasn't a Christian, a Christian, and didn't pray every day before I wrote the story, then I would say, okay, I got a lot of luck. I had a lot, a lot there, you know, but me being like a Christian guy and that's not perfect, nothing like that. I'm just a plain yeah, yeah, guy, right. but, but I just believe in God, period. But the thing is, if I didn't believe in any of that and I just, let's say, just as a figure of speech, I was an atheist and I just decided to write the short story and then it happened like that. Well, then I would just say, okay, it's a hundred percent luck or whatever. Um, I, I still have people telling me, oh, I just got lucky, you know. Um, but I, I keep telling them, well, that's a lot of luck, you know? Um, but yes, I, I already know I have psychic ability for once my pastor three days after this occurred. Okay. So now we're into, um, like the third January 12th, um, three days after I was in shock, anxiety, of course, could you imagine being you and you write a story and it comes true on exact month, day and year? With the exact scene, I put my story with the exact species of birds. I mean, I could have said there was hawks flying from the or falling from the sky. I could have said there was blue jays falling to the ground, but I got the exact species correct too. Um, but yes, I was I had tremendous anxiety, as you can see, I still have it after all these years, um, because the I guess part of the anxiety is being let down all the time. The news media just hanging up the phone. Hey, I got some guy on here says he wrote about the, yeah, yeah. You know, well, we'll get back to you, buddy, you know, and then I'll hang up the phone on me. But here's the thing. I proved it. That is the whole key of this whole thing. I proved it. Um, um, getting back to my pastor, my pastor, it's January 3rd now, 2012, three days after. I'm in complete shock. My wife goes, why don't you go tell somebody we can, you can trust, Michael, that'll listen to you. And I'm, I was so in shock, I didn't even think of my pastor, you know. And so she goes, why don't you talk to Pastor John, see what he says. So I went over there to the church, brought my book over, because it was already two years old. The pages were already old inside. I got my book in a bank vault down the street right now. But the thing is, he looked at it, and him and his wife, and he told me, Michael, you know, all the things you do for the church, you painted our cross, you did this. There's a 40-foot cross in front of the church I painted. It looked pretty bad. Um and stuff, he says, you know, 
I believe that you um, might be like a like a, a prophet. God gives us 500 um, talents, and I think that's one of the talents he gave you. Now, this is only my private opinion, but he said there's no other way to explain this, to get everything correct, and you told me you prayed and everything before you wrote. And I always wanted to be a Christian you know, writer, because, you know, you go to Barnes and Nobles and you see Christian authors that write scary books and stuff, you know. So mm-hmm. I, figured I, w- I figured I would give it a try, you know. And so I gave it 100%. I really did because of the meditation process part, you know. Um, but at the same time, it wasn't all, it wasn't all roses and, and stuff writing that book. Because I'll tell you why. While I was writing my book, I'd open up the windows in my office and stuff, Christina. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And the front door, in the door, and it's like 68 degrees. But I like to smell the, get the right smell when I'm writing, get into, like, what possibly would be in the future. And that's exactly what I did. Um, but I would come back to my table I was writing on, and Christina, after I started writing, eight inches from me on the table, there was white maggots. Out of nowhere, I looked to the left, white maggots. I mean, like worms. They weren't there like five minutes earlier. Uh, wow. Yeah. So I'm going, wait a minute now. Now this is, I'm, i got to be honest, this was like during the process that I'm writing. And I'm going, there's no, because they wouldn't have been there before because I, there's no way I'd be sitting here at your table writing and have maggots on top of the table without seeing them. I wouldn't be that lame brainish, you know. So anyways, I did clean up the maggots and threw them out, but it was just like, how in the world did they get there? Now that was a first real sign for me, you know, something's going on here. Um, uh, but I would lay on the bed and then show my wife. i say, honey, what do you think about this? And she'd read it, you know, that first opening you know, uh, December 31st, you know, I'm Mike Snow, my character, and I'm getting up at 5.45 a.m. and blah, 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 and the sun's rising up, and I see a black streak through it. So after I get to the blackbirds falling dead part and writing all that down, I show it to my wife. My wife goes, this, Michael, this is really, you know, pretty heavy and stuff. And I said, well, I want to draw my readers into the book. you got to have something different. You know, I'm not going to put, you know, the same old stuff usually authors write, you know. Um so, uh, getting back to, um, uh, so my story primarily is about good fighting evil, and I'm still doing it here, because I can't afford to move, you know, I don't make a lot of money, so I can't afford to move out of here, and we've been here, so I know how to deal with these um, entities that come in here now, but um, another another thing that happened to me, listen to this one, my daughter comes to give me a hug in our master bedroom, now it's all just a ranch, flat ranch house daughter comes to give me a hug in my in the bedroom and I'm sitting down on the bed and I, I'm hugging her I stand up and hug her thank God I pulled her to me a penny comes flying I, like it was shot out of a cannon hits my chest or falls down on the ground so I instantly stood up looked down the hall figuring okay the only one's home is my son so I figured he did it well his door shut and that door makes a noise when you open and shut it you know so I open up his door anyway, look at him, he's sound asleep, not breathing hard, you know, because if he did it, he could have ran back in the bed and then he'd be breathing hard. He was totally sound asleep, so he didn't do it. Um, So, and anyways, I stood up so fast and looked right into the kitchen. They would have to, whoever threw it would have to be like 12 feet before you have to go down a more narrow hall. And there's no way they could have went in there, my son couldn't have did it and shut the door, I wouldn't have heard the door shut, you know, he couldn't have jumped in the bed, pulled the blankets up, and and just, because that was a lot of footage, it was about 40 feet, you know, so, I'm, my daughter says, Daddy, who threw that penny, you know, she starts hugging me and crying, you know, and I didn't know what to tell her, you know, I'm not going right, to tell her, right. some entity threw it, you know, um, or some spirit, so whatever it was when she hugged me, that spirit was jealous because she she was hugging me. Now, I'm not going to tell you everything because I'm in the midst of writing right. my nonfiction version of my whole book right now. Um, but I'll, I'll throw one more thing at you, and that is I was having a garage sale in my garage. All of a sudden, a, 
you know, it was windy. The, my garage door that leads into my house blew open. Well, now it's blowing, let's see, south south to north. So my door's flat open, so I'm going, walking to the door, and I knew Christina ahead of time, and I felt it. I knew the door was going to slam in my face, and it did. It felt, I mean, but it wasn't the wind. It was some kind of entity because when it shut that door, I thought the door was going to crack in two. Um, so that's one other thing because, and, and here the wind was continuously blowing in, you know, to keep the door open. It was, it was blowing south to north. So there's, there's, it wasn't like the door opened, hit off the wall, and then it came back and shut and slammed real hard. The door was already uh, neutral. It was not moving anywhere. And I, I, so I was glad I knew that that was going to happen, but like that goes to my psychic kind of stuff, you know? Um, I got so much to tell. There's so much to tell in my stories. I'm really, um, but I do want to get the listeners cause I don't want to leave this out. The listeners to say, okay, how do we know you wrote this book? How do you, how do we know where's your proof at? Well, my proof starts with, uh, Dr. Leiter, uh, he works for Federal Forensics Associates, and he's been an ink forensic expert for 30 years. He handled a lot, a lot of high-profile celebrity cases, like the John Vonnet Ramsey case, where the mother said, okay, somebody was blackmailing them and wrote a letter, wanted $300,000 or whatever. And so this guy, Dr. Leiter, after talking to him, even before I hired him, I talked to him about six to eight times because I'm, I'm dirt, dirt poor and 4,000 to me, you might as well say it's 40 grand. Um, but I asked him specific questions that in the reason I hired him over any of the other ones and even the creator of Ink Forensic, Ajinsky, uh, Dr. Zali Ajinsky, he's the creator of forensics in the first place, but I didn't, I didn't hire him, but this guy is just as good anyway. Dr. Leiter, he's got a PhD. He's got every every kind of um, degree under the sun. He, I'll, I'll just tell you something here. He's got 30 years of experience. He was a forensic chemist, chemist for the U.S. Treasury Department for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Um, he's, he's got so many. If you could just hold on, please. I'm scrolling down on my computer. <laughs> no, it's fine. And you basically but, went to the, the forensic route because you wanted to be able to have actual proof that they could uh, do some forensic testing on the ink that you had written in your journal. Right, in my book, writing. my short story, to prove that my ink was older than December 31st, 2011, when my story played out identically. And he did. He did. Now, I dropped that book off in my old car, drove the 1,100 miles, met him at a uh, coffee shop, you know, the, your, your Starbucks, over there where he's at, over in Raleigh. And um, we, I met him, had the money for him, and basically I just told him precisely, I said, now, Dr. Leiter, and I, before I gave him the money, of course, I even asked him for an ID. Because <laughs> well, you can't blame me. I don't really right, know the right. guy, you know. But here I'm talking to this great, great scientist, and he treated me with such good respect. I mean, really. But I didn't tell him anything about, okay, if you do this, that's going to prove that I'm the only fiction and nonfiction author in the whole world in a single story. You know, um, I didn't tell him that. All I wanted him to do is, would you be able, Dr. Leiter, to test the ink and let me know if the ink's older than December 31st, 2011? Well, I was on a time clock besides because ink stopped dating after two years, see? So I wrote my story in 2009, right? But thank God I put the opening chapter of December 31st, 2011, uh, because that's what he was going by when he did his testing June, uh, in June 2013. He could only go back two years, which he did. He never said, okay, Mike, Michael, um, he didn't even bring up like the other forensic uh, experts did that, okay, we can run into this, Mr. Tom, and it could cost you more than the four grand because it could even come up inconclusive if the compounds of the ink don't come out the way that it's formulated. And they're talking to me all the science stuff. Dr. Leiter never asked me, like, what kind of uh, 
ink I had, what kind of pen it was. Um, he never said he couldn't do the job. That's why I hired him. There was no, no little small iota that he couldn't do the job. So you tell the confidence he had that he. Could oh yeah, yeah. He had the confidence, um, he, and he's definitely he's got so many degrees. Be it a bachelor's in chemistry, he went to Oklahoma City University in 1973. Bachelor's of bi uh, biology, Oklahoma City University in 1973. Master's in forensic sciences in science at the Washington University in 1975. He's got a PhD in analytical chemistry, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, 1999. He's trained in fiber, microscopic, I can't even say these words half the time, Institute of Paper Chemistry, 1975, X-ray spectrometry, spectrometry, State University of New York, 1976, question documents. But him now, and let me tell you what happened here. Half my page was coming out in my book, so I taped it in there. Dr. Leiter being such with, he's so thorough in it with integrity, he thought maybe I might have added pages to my book later. Why? Because these other forensic experts that I turned down, I'm not going to name, name who they are or anything, but the ones I turned down, they called him to tell him my story. So now he knew of my story. So now he knew the, the, the bigness of my story, how large it's going to be, would be, but he still went forward because he's a Baptist Christian himself. We had a little coffee, like I said, when I met him. And we shook hands and had, you know, he was very nice. But the point of the matter is these other people told him about my story. And so now in June uh, 2013 when he got to it, but I handed the book to him in March 2013. So he, had, he couldn't get to it till June because he was too busy, I guess. But he could only go from back two years from June 13. Uh, 2013, which still gives me June 2011, and I'm going to tell you his exact words right now while we have the time, his conclusion of the whole thing, and I'll read it word from word. It says here, the integrity of the exam and exhibit is compromised due to the condition and construction of the underlying project. It is, excuse me, it is reported that the underlying product is off interfere construction and subject to disassembly. The, p the poor condition of the exhibit, meaning my, no my composition book, it is uh, noted, and the presence attempted repair by tape in it also noted. In addition, there is evidence of multi-page removal, and, it, and the only reason there's pages missing from the composition book is because my daughter, while I was writing, says, Daddy, can I have some uh, paper to draw on, you know, crayons and stuff? And I said, sure, and I tear out some, you know. I, so, because right. I didn't know it was going to be my story was going to turn into reality, you know. How, you know, but anyway, that's the reason there. But anyways, as I continue, um, let me get down to this part. In addition, there is evidence of multiple page removal and extensive extremist in, indebted impressions. These reported facts, although troublesome, are not evidence of tampering or manipulation of the exhibit. The lack of the evidence to indicate that the presence of tampering or manipulation, however, should not be construed as proof of authenticity. The presence of the mul multiple ink formulations is an indication of the use of multiple writing instruments over a period of time in the construction and the writing appearing on the exhibit. All the ink for formulations present were similar to standard ink formulations that were commercial commercial commercially available during the time frame represented in the data printed on the exhibit. Um, the extraction characteristics of the several ink formulations present in the exhibit indicated, now hear this, that the writings were prepared prior to June 2011th, which means even before 2011th, which means uh, it was not possible to provide a specific date and time period of preparation due to the specific ink formulations present, present on the exhibit. This analysis should not be construed with proof of um, authenticity. But what Dr. Slider's saying there is, because I called him right away, I said, so if it's not proof of authenticity, you know, why did you put this in the whole paragraph that you, you said that the writings were prepared prior to June 2011? And Dr. Leiter said to me, Michael, what I meant is I couldn't prove you wrote it exactly on the, uh, September 11, 2009, see, 
uh, because I could only go back to two years, which I had to put prior to June 2011, uh, which makes sense. By their forensic law in Inc. Forensics, Inc. stops dating after two years. Don't ask me why, uh, <laughs> Christina, because I don't know. But then anyways, so when those pages, uh, he also indicated that the blank ink uh, dates earlier than the blue ink. Well, I started off my short story, Christina, in black ink. So black ink, he can only date back about a year and a half. But if my black ink is before my blue ink and all the pages are still attached, that would have to mean I wrote, mean I wrote the black ink and the blue ink are the same age. So to make sure that I didn't tamper with the book, that's why he hired John Paul Osborne, his good friend that has used in other court cases out of Middlesex, New Jersey. Now, the findings from Mr. Osborne, who's got 30 years experience, his family's got one of the oldest modern forensic, do he's a forensic document examiner, okay? He's not an ink forensic, a forensic document examiner to make sure nothing's tampered with, manipulated, or anything. This is what Mr. Paul Osborne says. Uh, it is my opinion of the underlying that while the notebook bears obvious evidence of wear and tear, and while it is apparent that there are pages that have been taped in the binding, and while it did the testing June 2013, which puts it that I wrote it prior to June 2011, which is still over a half a year, or you could go to where I signed the book, because I signed it, Christina, when I started the book in Ink Pen. Uh, I started the book September 11th, 2009, except I put 09-11, you know, uh, in 2009. So, anyways, yes, I did it. And these forensic experts not only proved that I wrote the book before and I didn't tamper with it, they also proved I time-traveled, Christina. I've got, I'm the first probably guy in the United States that's got proof that I time travel, meaning everything I wrote happened on the exact month, day, and year. You know, I got the climate conditions correct. It happened 100 miles down the street. The only thing I got wrong was the town. I said the blackbirds were falling dead here in Rogers, okay? While now I meet, I meet Elaine Williams, the journalist who put it in the newspaper. She's a friend of mine on Facebook. She's got 25 years' experience as a journalist. Me and her talked on the phone. She goes, Michael, you know, I believe your story and stuff because we met on LinkedIn. I got up my book on LinkedIn. And she called me Prophet Tomlin. So I'm trying to figure, after I got the forensics done, what was that journalist's name, you know? So I'm going there and, and went back to my LinkedIn page and found her, you know, and called her back up because they wouldn't print my story in my own town here in Rogers. And that's another song and dance, but that's also in my book. So I don't want to spill the beans what happened when I went down down there with my book and all that, uh, you know, I felt really disappointed that they turned me down, but I didn't stop because, you know, you just keep going. Anyways, just Helene Williams told me, Michael, I did some investigating. I said, yeah. She goes, your story didn't happen two times in a row. It happened three times in a row. And I said, wait, what are you talking about? She said, Michael, birds, blackbirds, your phenomenon you wrote about, they died and dropped it over there in New Jersey, and uh, I believe she said New Jersey, or um, uh, in New Jersey, in August twenty was it twenty twelve? I think twenty twelve. Uh, and I said, "You're kidding me!" And she goes, "I know she wasn't because she wouldn't have called me up and told me, you know." But I mean, it was just a figured speech. I was in shock. You're kidding, you know. Uh, but no, they did. So not only did I already have the fringes completed and. She was just about ready to print the story because I sent her to the forensics in the, um, you know, on a fax. Um, yeah, so my story happened three years ago. Well, I did more investigating just to, just to do some investigation. And I think the Huff, that was the Huffington Post posted that in Canada, December, in December 2014. Now, my chapter opened December 31st in December, but it's December 31st, 2011. Um, but over there in Canada, the Blackbirds fell dead there, too. Uh, and just recently, I guess yesterday, over in Memphis, Tennessee. But here's the thing. I'm a Christian guy. What this is to me is God gave me a message, and here's the message. This is what the reason the Blackbirds died. Not because of fireworks or nothing like that. To me, the vision I got is God sending the message, gave it to me, 
put it in a story so later I could authenticate it and get it, you know, justified to tell people, hey, miracles happen. There, there can be modern prophets that live in our today's society. And the other thing is our lives can end on a dime just like the blackbirds fell dead from the sky on a dime. In other words, Jesus can come in a blink of an eye like a thief in the night when we don't even realize it. You know what I mean? So anyways, um, everybody's I'm open to, you know, everybody's got, if they want to believe in God, fine. If they don't, that's not my job is judging people and I don't judge people. You know, I'm a very nice guy. Um, but one thing is to say you time traveled and you can do it. Now, before I even forget it, there's a lady who's very reputable on Facebook and she lives in Mexico. Are you still there, Christina? Yeah, I'm here. She lives, I mean, she's on my Facebook page, knows a lot of celebrities. And in fact, you know, as you know, I got a lot of celebrities on my Facebook page. But I told her she lives in Mexico, and I love the Mayans, the pyramids. That's why I have all that on my Facebook page. I told her and gave her a message one evening. She wasn't there. And I told this lady that be careful in Mexico where you live. Because I feel that there's going to be an earthquake about a 7-2 to a 7-4. I left that like, let's say, 8.30 at night in her private mailbox. The next morning, they had the 7.2 and 7-4. And, and, you know, in, in a way, she knows. She put it out there that, you know, Michael, you know, and she knows I have this ability. And then I gave her another heads up, and it happened again. So that was two in a row that I told her. Now... When I did talk to the editor's secretary over here in Rogers, uh, right after it happened, like somewhere in around April of 2012, four months later, because I was still in shock all that time, couldn't think properly, um, this lady did listen to me for an hour and a half, and I got her name and everything because I took the notes. I got all the notes and everything. But anyways, she listened to me for an hour. I told this lady, and I know her name, and she knows this, because she was writing it down. She goes, you don't mind if I write this down? I said, no, 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 write it down. But then after I hung up on the phone with her, I called her back and said, you know, ma'am, I forgot to tell you one more thing. Um, I think I, I think there's going to be an earthquake over on the uh, West Coast, about a 7-2 to a 7-4. And after I told her that on a Monday, it happened Tuesday. <laughs> I am not lying she knows it. She wrote it down. I still got her name, but for some mysterious reasons, they transferred her from here, I guess. Now she's over in Fayetteville, uh, but, um, or she could be gone. I'm not sure. But anyways, she was very sweet to me. And I told her if my book or something ever comes, you know, I'm going to bring you a dozen roses for just listening to me for that 45 minutes. <laughs> I'm not hanging up the phone, you know. Um, well, but, I, you know, I will tell you, I mean, I 100% think that, you know, the information that you got from or for your book that you use for your book were absolutely visions. My question to you is, you know, being somebody who gets visions, because as I said, I get them not only about certain situations that will happen. Um, but I also get them quite often when it comes to natural disasters, just like you say, like, you know, volcanoes, earthquakes, tornadoes, things like that, flooding. Uh, and I used to post them all the time on my Facebook, and then they would, you know, come to be. But, you know, uh, when you've been doing this as long as I've been doing it, you know, there are so many people who believe, don't believe, and a lot of time religion is very tied to it. Um, I'm glad to see that. Uh, religion is starting to be a little bit more open and accepting of, you know, that uh, this is a gift and, you know, that it's not something, you know, the work of the devil or anything like that. And, you know, people... No, because I talk... I, no, and, and, and what what's strange is, too, which is going to be in my other book, I mean, my nonfiction book, these this one pastor, I because I would go to food banks, get food for the family and stuff, and... This pastor I talked to is a missionary pastor for 45 years. I told him my story, right? The same day they turned me down in the newspaper here locally, this pastor calls me up and goes, Hey, Mike, would you mind meeting me and another pastor over at our church? And would you mind bringing me your book? It blew me away because I'm wondering, why in the world would two pastors, I don't even go to their church, why do they want to 
me to come over there. But he was a real nice guy, you know. But so anyways, that's going to be in my book too, um, which will come out probably th- this fall because I have a real professional author helping me. She's super sweet, and um, and we're going to make this work. Um, and so they they were they questioned me about the Bible stuff like that. Looked at the book, you know, and. They they just had their mouths open, and and in fact, the missionary pastor for forty five years says, and I got his name and everything. He says, you know, I couldn't answer that better myself. <laughs> he totally looked at the other younger pastor. You know, the younger pastor was just like, I don't know, he was sort of in shock. Um, but um, I still wanted to know if I could do it. You know, my psychic stuff, and I tested myself last summer, and I haven't did it really since then. And I wanted to see what would happen to me, like two weeks down the line. So I thought of what would happen to me, and it played out. It did. I mean, everything at the same place where I ride my bike, everything happened in that event precisely where that, you know, where I envisioned that that would take place. Um, so it's it's really strange, but at least we know what I wanted to do is. And my story is really not even about me. I'm just a writer. Um, my story is all about having faith in God, and I asked him to give me a good story, and he did because there's no way in the world I think anybody's going to top, you know, uh, having a, writing a story and have it really as fiction and have it come true, you know, four years in a row, m- me and my phenomenon, uh, and two years in my own state that I wrote it occurring on just 100 miles down the street. Um, and plus, the forensics also did help me that I time travel, too, Um well, I guess that I, I, that's my question, though, is because, you know, uh, receiving information through visions and time right. traveling are... I, I call it mind it. traveling. I call it mind traveling. <laughs> I do. I call it mind traveling. But it's so fun. You, like after projecting? Oh, yeah, yeah. And... um, I can read people. I can read people. Like this other guy... You know, I, I go to a gas station, go get some coffee, right? And this guy's walking toward me, and I just had to ask him. I said, um, I, I said, you, you're a psychiatrist, aren't you? And he goes, oh, are you one of my patients? And I said, no, 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 no. I said, I just, you know, um, you just look like a psychiatrist to me. But I knew him because I could hear him as he passed me. I could hear him, like, talking to one of his patients, you know. It, it, it's it's really strange. But, but anyways, I... Put it this way, the time I was done talking to him, right, he forgot to get his coffee and was walking out of the store. I said, you forgot your coffee up at the counter, you know. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's – um, but there's other people like me out there, but they're just very – don't want to come out because they're probably worried that everybody's going to make fun of them and stuff, and they did. They made fun of my son over at a school he went to. Hey, was it your dad in the newspaper? Because they put it, you know, in the Little Rock – paper which comes out this way anyway they said hey hey Tolan, was that your dad you know that weirdo uh, you know that wrote that story and of course my son said no no it wasn't my dad you know and i couldn't really he, he lied and he really shouldn't have but he would have to explain to like what 50 of his friends because he plays football you know what i mean and it, it was just it's just sad how people label people all because they have some kind of unique ability you know what i mean Right. Well, you know, again, there's a lot of people that, you know, even if you educate them, it's not going to change how they feel. I mean, it's just like with, you know, somebody who may be, you know, say atheist and not believing in, you know, God, you're not going to be able to convince them just by telling them something, you know, that make them convert. You know, with anything, um, it usually takes, you know, something very pronounced or a very uh, personal situation to happen to make somebody change their mind. And like for a skeptic, if something, you know, paranormal happens personally to them that is, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know, normal. And and the other thing is, which is going to be in my second book too, could you imagine yourself now knowing you've done almost something that was totally, totally and almost way off the charts. I mean, the probability, people don't realize the probability aspect of somebody getting writing a story and having it come true in the first place is probably like a one in, the, in a billion. 
you know. And the, the, the first guy to do it was Morgan Andrew, Andrew Robertson. He wrote the book Futility in 1898. He died in 1915. That's where they got the movie from, the Titanic, the Titanic movie, from his movie, I mean, from his book Futility, which is about a ship he created in his fiction book called The Titan, hitting the iceberg, sinking with the people on it. Uh, he got the exact year the Titanic, I, I believe, sank, and he got the exact month the Titanic sank, except he called his ship the Titan, but he was awful close. you got to give it to the guy. You know what I mean? So he was actually, he was actually the first modern uh, fiction and nonfiction author, or clairvoyant writer, but he, he, he didn't even think he had visions, or he doesn't classify himself from reporters uh, as that. Um, well, m many don't. Many don't. I mean, that's the whole thing, is that they don't even understand, you know, like when you're talking about clairvoyant writing and things like that. A lot of people with, like, abilities, you know, uh, knew they had something going on with them, but none of us claimed, like, oh, we're psychics. I mean, I tell this to people all the time. I mean, up until I, you know, started investigating and was out in the public eye, um, and I was, you know, with another group, and they're really the ones that kind of uh, put me out there, you know, and let my my story be known about being a psychic. And it, it, from there, it kind of just it, it just kind of went from there. But most people, um, you know, don't really realize, you know, that what exactly their abilities are. Um, and sometimes they'll have, you know, they'll experience many different things. So well, you know, yeah, it yeah. can even change. Right, right. One of the strange things I can do is sometimes I can drop a dollar bill and it'll stand straight up, not vertically, you know, with ways. It'll stand up on a table. And my daughter, who's only 11, she's got tremendous psychic ability. Me and her can interconnect. I mean, it'll be like I'll be thinking of her or some kind of thing, and she's just, you know, really – gifted to already um i already know that but um the other thing is um i'm so grateful you had me on the show because uh oh the other thing is i wanted to tell you is my pastor even gave me a certified letter him and his wife signed it uh that's what's in my facebook stuff when i put it out there uh and it's the pastor letter um and my pastor says, let it be known on January 3rd or 4th, 2012, Mike Tomlin brought his book to show us. During the following weeks, my wife and I both read Mike's book. In our opinion, Power Outage, Power Outage was certainly written way before this date. We have known Mike Tomlin for eight to nine years, and we do believe his account was written in 2009. We have been serving Charity Baptist Church for 23 years. Mike attended Charity for seven years and is a faithful member during those years, and he signed it, had it certified, went to the bank. And I, I submitted that, too, because Dr. Leiter uh, said any evidence you can bring to substantiate your story, regardless of what my findings are or anybody else's findings, it puts makes your, your story stronger, you know. And well, so that's, I, think, I think it's even bigger than that, though, Michael, because I think that's powerful because, you know, you've been part of this congregation for a very long time. And I will tell you that, you know, in, again, many organized religion, um, whether it be Christian-based or not, um, are, are still very leery of, you know, uh, people stating to have psychic abilities, but they're starting to come around. So for you to have been uh, with your congregation for so long where people had, really gotten to know you and know the integrity of you and things exactly like where you came out with this story that they without a doubt didn't even question your you know if you were you know being honest or not and then after reading it you know um people i think like i said in you know, the whole thing the whole thing big, yeah the whole thing is funny because when i had my i only had at that time a 1990 uh in 2013, car, which I'm not ashamed of. I bought it off our church. I'm not ashamed that I'm poor. It just shows you that God can give you, uh, you know, different, uh, if you believe and have faith, he can do anything for you, regardless if you're poor or rich or whatever, you know. Um, right. And it's how you look at it as well. You know, I mean, people right. a lot of times, they, 
feel that they are or they are being judged based on their wealth or what materialistic things they have. When you are on, you know, like just a, you know, people are starting to be on a whole other level where it's so not about materialistic things. They're just happy oh, to no. have the things that they that they need. And, you know, you're, when you're very humble like that. Right. The reason God gave me this ability, and I know that because he told me, is to help the poor and needy with the money I make from the book. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to make, uh, like around here, there's a lot of homeless people. I'm really sort of pretty poor, but I also help the homeless because I know who they are, and I'll see them and say, hey, you need this, do you need that? Give them five bucks. It's not much, but, you know, I got a family too, so I'm just, you know, keep my, I got a chronic illness so if I go to work full time, they cut my benefits. I mean, right. they'll take away my stuff and they won't pay. And my medicine's five grand a year. I mean, a month. Right, right, right. I take the I, I run in. I run into the exact same situation, you know. And it's interesting that many people uh, who do have psychic abilities or are in this field. Of, again, we share a lot of very similar stories, histories, uh, illnesses, things like that. Uh, I have a, a chronic terminal illness with no cure, um, and I've been, you know, suffering with it for a very long time. So I get what you get, and I don't have a lot of money, but myself and my team, we are constantly, I, on a weekly basis, uh, anything that I have, because I, you know, will cook every night, and then whatever I have is leftovers, you know, uh, all of my children are grown, and although I've got, you know, an adult daughter who lives with me, um, she's an adult now, so her and my grandson are on and off, you know, wherever. Uh, And so it's like we don't always eat together. So a lot of times I'll have leftovers. And at the end of the week, I will gather them all up and plate them, you know, all up, heat them, put a foil on them, and go and pass them out to the local homeless. And, you know, we do, we go and pass out gloves and scarves and uh, hats and things like that at wintertime. That is cool. That is cool. I mean, that's fantastic. You should, I mean, really, because I, I do the same thing. See, Jesus uh, made furniture when he was young. I restore furniture. I take people's junk, restore it, and sell it, and, and like on Craigslist and stuff, you know. Uh, plus, I work part-time, you know, uh, and stuff. So I do a lot of different things. But then I'm like a vampire, sort of, because I write at night. But, um, yeah, there's like about seven or eight paranormal stuff I didn't even mention to you that are just would blow your socks off. Um, so, yeah, the what, I, what happens, I'm not sure what it is here, um, you know, but, but I think it's a spirit, but sometimes it's not like a human spirit that was here. And the reason I say that is because I'm not going to go into that, but because that part I'm gonna, I wanted to put in my book, come to think of it. But, um yeah, the thing is we have to remember, if you do believe in God, and I think you do, right, Christina? I can't mm-hmm. remember if you do. Mm-hmm. Okay. The thing is people have to remember that, and, and, and especially like I'm a Baptist kind of guy, and our pastor just gives it to us, no cherry or whipped cream on top. When Lucifer was up in heaven, I'm just going to say this real short, he was a real good angel, but then he thought he was better than God was, so God casted him down from heaven because he thought he was the boss, meaning Lucifer. So when uh, Lucifer was cast down here to earth, then his name changed to Satan. Well, and God also casted Satan down and his angels. They are here. They are real, you know. And people got to realize that, that you got to keep their shields strong. That if they're not, that if they are Christians, um, keep your shield strong, study the scriptures, know when these entities, because God gives me the power to know these entities. So I'm like, Michael, the, the, I'm in this house, can't move, I can't move again because I don't have the money to move, and trying to finish up my book. But this entity tried to play with me the last two times in writing it. Um, it tried to get into my computer and screwed my computer up, and it did. So I had to restart my book again, Christine. I was like three-quarters done. So then when my computer crashed, and I believe it was from the spirit, um, uh, this time when I'm writing, I use what they call a thumb jack while I'm writing. So I, you know what I mean? You plug it in on the side, and it'll store your, right. your book. It's like a backup. So I always keep that thumb drive because I'm like, okay, if this entity doesn't want this story get out, to get out, it's going to have a battle. And it battles me, it, it, you know. Um, uh, not last, I think it was last summer, 
my daughter and me, you know, I was taking her to a birthday party, got into my car, and everything was fine with us. And I adjusted the mirror in the front, and Christina, the whole back window was full of bees, full of bees. You couldn't even see the glass. Where these bees came from, I don't have a clue. No clue at all. So I told my daughter, Delilah, I says, now, Delilah, I says, I want you to open up your door, but don't slam it, and don't turn around and just get out, you know, and then run up to the front door and get inside. And I said, just do it. And while I'm watching her get out, I look to my arm, and here's two bees on my arm. And then one landed on my neck. And I'm going, oh, great, because I hate bees and wasps, you know. Um but they didn't sting me. They did not sting me. I couldn't believe it. And then a gust of wind came, the bees got out. So then I got out trying to figure out how to get these bees out of my, you know, back window. I didn't have no pop in there to draw them to, any open containers in the car. There was nothing in the car that would draw these bees to my back window. Um, so I didn't have no bee spray or anything, so I used my wife's hairspray, figuring that would kill them. And they were stubborn as stubborn as could be. They hung around for three days, and they were gone. But why me, why my window, I don't have a clue. Another weird thing happened in the morning, going on for a job interview, and I don't mind this because I love wildlife, but there was a hawk sitting right on the center of my car looking right at me. I mean, so I can't believe it didn't fly off. I'm only like six feet away from it. Um and it just stared at me, so I just stared at the hawk, you know, but it was sunny. it was like it was trying to talk to me, sort of, you know what I mean? Um, and I'm not crazy, you know, and, and it was just, it was just strange, and then it flew away, but it was just something about this place I'm in, and it's got to be something connected or something, you know. Um, and one last thing I'll spill the beans on, which is another paranormal thing that happened. We had these cylinder blocks up in front here on the corner of my house, now, these blocks are like 30 pounds a piece. If you ever lift a cylinder block, they're heavy. Anyway, they're evenly stacked and stuff. My kids already know that, and they've experienced, like my son will even sometimes now, he's six feet tall, 200 pounds, four, 15 years old, but he'll still run sometimes down the hall because he gets bad feelings, right? Uh, and he'll run in our room. And the thing is, we are out in front in the daytime, and... My son said something to my daughter, like, what are you scared that these ghosts from here are going to get you or something? Right after he said that, the stack of cement blocks, cylinder blocks, shifted, shifted and fell. The only way that those blocks could shift and fall, it would be a super strong force. You you know what I'm saying, uh, Christina? Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, that is really yeah, they shifted. They fell like a, two or three of them just fell right after he said that. Like they were out there listening. This entity was actually listening, and I believe they do. You know, I oh, yeah. never, I never tell. And I already know this place that has entities in it and evil spirits. Why I got to go to the library and do some investigating on the property itself. You know, find out right. who was here before, do some research on it, because here I'm a Christian guy trying to just live a normal life, at the same time fight entities, and at the same time was given a gift by God to write a story that really happened and went to extreme lengths to prove it, 1,100 or 1,200 miles one way in my old car, praying all the way, just had enough money for gas and get back. When I, coming back, I went through storms with the car, everything. It was just like fighting the devil all the way back just to get to my house. Um... It was just, and then finally I got home, I kissed the ground because the car made it, you know what I mean? There and back. But I knew I was safe. It was in his hands. It was in the forensic expert's hands. I did it, you know. Now, the other thing was waiting for him to come up with his conclusion on the whole thing. Well, I already knew that I did it, and it's older than that because, you know, I'm a Christian guy, and I did it, you know. But he told me um, we had a little not so good conversation because he says, Michael, why didn't you tell me that you it's all over the internet that you did this? You should have told me, you should have told me up front. I said, Dr. Leiter, I says, I hired you to do the ink forensics to, to, to date the ink. And when I met you, you told me, you know, um, you told me, Hey, I don't care what you wrote, what the story's about. Cause I asked him, are you going to, oh, right. are you going to base my story on how I wrote the story or anything? 
He goes, no, I'm not going to base it on the story, Michael. I, mean, I don't care what you wrote. You just pay me the four thousand dollars. I'll prove that. What I'll well, try right. to prove his, what yeah, you his pay job me is. Yeah, just to do what you paid him to do. And if he was to have any back information, you know, that would kind of prejudice possibly, you know, his thoughts on on all of it. So, but, I mean, but he, you know what? He was just upset because he got this from these other forensic guys I turned down because they said, oh, if we run into this, it's another two grand. If we do this. Now, to be 99 or 100 percent sure that I didn't add pages or anything, they would have to tear the book apart. And... I'm not going to have um, Mr. Osborne take the book apart when he's already stated what I needed him for to say. And right. So in the forensics uh, that Dr. Leiter did are like 99.5, you know, every year these forensic experts keep a library of ink for every year that passes. So they know the compounds, where when it breaks down, they each scientist did about 18 different, or if not 20 different tests on my book. They had my book for seven months. Seven months. Oh, since wow. March, March, yeah, I didn't get it from March 2013 all the way to October when I got the book. Oh, excuse me. Now, the forensics I got in the mail, I got the envelope right here. I kept it. I kept all my receipts for the hotel and stuff because I figured if this story ever makes it, this is going to, you know, I'll have all the, the stuff, you know, uh, to back me up. But I got the envelope that came in, and when I tore that envelope up, you can imagine how I was tearing the, this priority mail, United States envelope up uh, with Dr. Leiter's, you know, all writings on it and to me. And when I opened up and read it, at first I was furious because I came to that part in the paragraph where it says, don't use this as a, authenticity. But no, no, he, he, I took it the wrong way, you know. But, yeah, he, um, the best part was flying there to pick up my book because he didn't mail me my book, Christina. I'm not going to have him mail my book and have it lost in the mail. You see, then I lose all my evidence. So right. my mechanic, who I only see two months a year, spotted me the money, and he's going to be in my book too. So nice of him to spot me the money. After I showed him on the Internet everything, he handed me like 1800 just as quick as, and then I flew to go pick up my book rather than take my old car again. I already knew the results from the forensics, and I had the reports and read them. Both scientists cleared me. I was smiling on that DC, whatever it was, 10 leaving Northwest Arkansas Airport. Did you meet him? And it was so sunny above the clouds, and I'm just traveling all the way to meet him. Uh, over in the Burham or Raleigh, wherever the airport was there. And he met me at the airport, and I saw him, and it was funny because he was completely different, differently dressed. These scientists are so private. He was dressed like a tourist. He was like, he's going on a beach. Uh, but anyway, it was a good disguise. Um, and I said, Dr. Leiter, I said, thank you for doing your job. With integrity, even knowing the, you know, you did your job with super, super integrity, and I'm super proud of you. And, you know, the other scientist I'm proud of, too. And he goes, well, Michael, do me one favor. He says, if the story gets out there, I don't I want to be in the limelight or anything, so keep me out of it. You know, these scientists do not like publicity. They don't like, like anything to do. Because they do a lot of federal cases, too, seeing stuff, you know, for the government, Washington, right. you know. So they're super, super private. And um, I just hugged them, and, and then I said, thank you for doing this, and you did your job, and, um, and I appreciate you. And I said, can we still remain friends, though? Can I still call you or something? And I really got to do that. You know, I haven't called them to thank them um, Lately, and Mr. Osborne, every time I called him, I got his answering machine. But there's, he didn't even know me from Adam. I never talked to the guy. Um, but he did his job, too. Like he said, even though this, this document is old and stuff, Mr. Thomas did not manipulate ad pages or anything. So you got two scientists with over 60 years' experience that dedicate their lives to telling the truth. Um, and, you know, I can't say no more than, hey, if my next book, when it comes out, about what I went through with all the paranormal stuff and how my book didn't really occur, if my story doesn't go and sell and become a hit, 
then I'm going to give up writing because if a guy writes a story and it comes through four years in a row and that doesn't cut the mustard, you know, I don't know what does if you ask me, Christina. Do you? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think that, you know, you should base your, you know, writing career, you know, based off of, of one thing. I mean, it is an extraordinary, you know, um, story, and it's, it's one that I believe that, you know, yes, people will, will definitely enjoy. Um, I mean, I mean, put it this way. Seriously, if Rod, Ster- uh, Rod Serling, okay, I tried to get in his touch with his daughters back in 2012. They probably thought I was some kind of nut. I didn't have the forensics done yet for proof. But I got, his, I think, his wife's number. I'm going to give her a call and see if I can get in touch with him. But I'm just telling you, if Rod Serling was alive, and let's say he was in his 80s, and he knew I did this, and I sent him the reports, he would be at my front door right now, no doubt. He would, because his stories, he was always writing about fiction because he wanted, he, I felt, and from looking at him, and I admire him so much since I was six years old, I really felt through his stories, he was wanting to do what I exactly did. He, he wanted to, um, what, in some of the stories he really did, but I mean, he, I felt that he really wanted to write a story that would, really come alive, but maybe not with such preciseness like mine. I mean, it's really weird, but um, I just think he wanted to do what I I did. And and if he was alive, I know he'd be probably knocking at my door. I even tried to get in touch with Stephen King one time. I tried to do that. I admire Stephen King, you know. Um, But but the thing is, when you to word it right, when you're talking to these people, I'm grateful for the celebrities I do have. Um, For me to get a tag from Al Pacino in a, in a picture was, and I adore the guy. He's a superb actor. I love him to death. And then get another tag from Robert De Niro. Um, you know, and then the Laham Neeson gave me a few likes and I knew a, a few private friends of his that I associate with. And he, Laham Neeson, you know, went through a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, lost his wife. And, and still making all these movies. He keeps going, keeps going, and not letting himself down. And that's what I'm going to do. All these stars give me ambition to keep going. Um, you know, and and I can't believe, you know, so many people said, oh, don't get affiliated with all the celebrities, but because they're all, like, they're, they're above the normal person. And that's just the opposite. I don't judge anybody, and they're super nice people. Uh, it's just the opposite of what, other people told me that they would be. It's totally the opposite. They're they're super nice, you know. And, well, uh, I think you have to kind of use, you know, your your own ability to kind of gauge people and people's energies because for just as many, you know, uh, bad people that are, you know, uh, celebrities or are in the, you know, uh, Hollywood community or whatever that they can say are bad, there's just that many or if not even more that are really, really good people problem is is that you usually don't hear about those people you know the one that you hear about is it's always when it has some kind of drama or negativity attached to it exactly you don't uh, yeah and here the here they're um like oh gosh i can't even think of uh charles reese the matrix guy the star of the matrix right okay he he's he's, uh, uh, what's his name chris reese yeah, Chris, well, Christopher Rees, but he's got Charles on his Facebook, so. Uh, but anyways, he, he became my friend, and I'm trying to, like, get the point to him that I really, really did this, you know. And I think there's some correlation with what I can do with what the Matrix movie was. And, and where, you know, sort of like time traveling in your mind and stuff. And um, I just think that I proved that we don't know all the capabilities of a human being. Like, we, we, we always thought that what I did couldn't happen, and I proved that it can happen, and it can happen to anybody, you know. I'm not a special snowflake or nothing, but, right. Right. but the, thing, and, and, and the thing is, with, with the money I make from my book, I just plan on, you know, of course, helping my family a little bit, but, but a lot of it toward helping the poor and the needy, and I'm just going to keep going, and if I can keep predicting things and warn people ahead of time and save lives, I'm going to do it, you know. Regardless if they think I'm weird and it does happen, which it usually does, um, you know, and a lot of people try to say to me, they call me over here the fortune teller. Oh, hey, hey, there goes the fortune teller. I'm not a fortune teller. 
<laughs> and I told them my neighbor next door, you know, I don't, I'm not going to tell you how long you got to live and all that stuff. I'm not into that. I'm like earthly effects. I can, I can detect evil, like spirits, stuff like that. I'm very good at that. Um, right. Well, that's because a lot of people, you know, they just, when they hear about psychic abilities, they lump everything into kind of like one. And nobody really knows, but everybody thinks it's something different. Like when people see me and they find out I'm a psychic, I always get that little like, weird look that they, and they're like, oh, you're a psychic. And then, you know, it's always about, okay, well, what am I thinking right now? You know, and I'm like, well, I'm not a mind reader, so I have no idea. I, you know, I don't know the lottery numbers because if I did, I would be rich. Um, you know, I'm not going to tell you, if you, you know, if your husband or wife is cheating on you. Like, those are not what I do. You know, You're right. Like, exactly. Exactly. You know, you, you know exactly where I'm coming from. I mean, I go through right. the exact same thing. And, and see, this is a small town. So when I go over to, like, Walmart and go shopping or something, the people that know my story, like the ladies, older ladies and stuff, a lot of them, even some of them are so nice, they give me the sign of the cross when I come or I walk past them. Um, I'm not in, in meaning that... I'm evil or anything, but just the opposite way, like a blessing, you know. Right. Um, and um, it's, you know, um, and I, I've had major disappointments. There was a university that was doing, looking for time travelers. So then when I get in touch with the professor and send him all my stuff, even the forensic proof, he goes, I think it just totally freaked him out, Christina. I just think, I, I mean, the vibes I got from him was complete freaked him out and then he says to me i'm not looking for that type of time traveler and i'm saying to myself i didn't realize there was that many with proof that they time travel you know um which is i mean because you know hearsay is one thing evidence is another you know right but again i mean for time travelers for the way that most people think of time travelers you will see people who have um tra <clears throat> traveled and, you know, taking pictures, you know, in another time or another era or, you know, things like that. And, um, you know, things like that are starting to come forward, actually. And so they are doing some of that. Um, you know, for what I feel what you're actually doing is that, you know, you are just getting into such a deep meditation that you are allowing, you know, yourself to, you know, receive the information that's being given, which are, you know, transferred kind of into a vision. Um, exactly. I don't know per se that you're time traveling anywhere. I think that, you know, um, the more... I don't, mean, I, I don't mean time traveling physically. I just meant mentally, you know. Well, well, right, right. But I mean, still that it's, I mean, I guess that's not really the correct analogy for what, you know, what you're you're doing. I mean, you're just getting into such a deep, and most people don't understand, like, about meditation. And, and it, you know, a lot of times, I'll, like, when I'm working with my students and they'll say, oh, you know, meditation, why do we have to do meditation? Like, what's it for? What's the purpose? Blah, blah, blah. It's boring. You know, and, but as they do it, the more they do it, the better connected they get, then the, the information starts flowing. They're able to, you know, uh, connect with, uh, if they have a spirit guide or, or whatever, um, their ability may be is, however they're connecting. And by being able to really get deeply into your meditation, I mean, you're really able to open yourself up where, again, uh, I, I usually, I usually go like you got to be outdoors. I mean, all my meditation. Oh yeah. All my, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm outdoors, smelling, looking at the birds, just watching things. Right, um, connecting with I'm not, like, nature. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love nature. And where I go, there's nobody. I mean, there's right. No people would say, well, where I go, there's snakes that pass me. <laughs> Branchulas. No, really, it's like crocodile Dundee uh, in the summer anyway. Um, but. I don't get hurt there, and I go out in this field where I get energy from the ground. There's a lot of gravity, like gravitational pull here in Arkansas, a lot more than other places I've been to. Uh, but anyways, and I use the sun, I use meditation, and I use my faith, see. And I know I, I have this, and it's just, I think... Um, you know, the reason I bring out my story is because if I didn't bring out my, my story, if you're if you're a writer and you love writing, what writer wouldn't bring it out in the open that he did something incredible, right? I mean, come on. Right, right. 
mean, I mean, the, the, and, and I have, I've got friends who are computer geeks. I'm not a computer geek at all. And so, and some of them are in physics and they just say, what you did was just like way off the charts, you know? And I, I realize that, but that's why it's a miracle thing I got, you know, I got this gift from God to do that, you know? Um, but let's see here. Well, one, I believe one, that the information that you were given, you know, you were given for a reason, you know, and the best way for if, you if, to be if, able to translate that was to put it into a book. The thing is, is that at the time, you did not realize yourself that the information you were being given was of things that were to come. You thought they were information because you were praying for, you know, information to, you know. But, make but there was a voice that told me not to throw the book out, Christina. A little voice in my head, just like the voice in my head, told me to get up and start writing. I didn't have a choice. It was a command. Right, um, right. So, so what I'm saying is, um, uh, you know, when, when, I, when I get this, when I got that at that time, it, it wasn't from my own being, you know. And I remember little stuff in the Bible, like where Jesus said, uh, I guess to Paul, you'll, you'll uh, mock me three times and the crow will crock three times. And here Jesus used the crow, see. Um, and, and then I feel that God used the birds too, and my dog, all together, a combination to have me write this story and that it was going to occur, uh, and it did. Um, but um, if, they, if people want my – do you mind if I tell them where they can get my ebook? It's only 11. No, I was, I, yeah, I was going to say because we've got about four minutes left, so I'd like you to go ahead and give the information where you, uh, can, all right. they can, you can go the book and contact you. All right. Now, uh, remember that this book is very, um, it's very, very short. But what I wrote in that book, yes, it identically happened. It did happen. So, anyways, you can go to Kindle ebook, and my ISIN number is B O O A D D I H N S. So, uh, my ISN number again is B O O A D D I H N S. And you go to Kindle ebook. Now, it, it should take you right there. If it doesn't, just go to Kindle ebook, put my book title there on the line, power outage, and then put my name, Michael Tomlin, and it'll pop up anyway. So either way, you can also it. send me the, the link, uh, Michael, and I can, and I'll post it up, uh, under the, on the Paranormal Connection page. Okay, very good. You know, I've been looking for the link myself. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking for that thing, but I'm going to try to find it. I mean, it's, it's strange. But I'm not really worried about this book because it's so, it's so short. My nonfiction book that I'm coming out with will have everything in it, you know. And it'll be oh, okay. probably about 375 pages long. Um, All right. Well, when you get that I appreciate out, you yeah. having me on the show. I appreciate your producers having me on the show. And if you ever want to do another show for some reason, maybe after my other book comes out or something, uh, or you just want to um, discuss things, uh, feel free to call me because I'm learning too, you know, and you're a very nice person, and God bless you, and thanks for having me on the show. Well, thank you so much, you know, for coming and sharing your story. It's very, very interesting, and, you know, you're always welcome on. Uh, definitely once you uh, get your next book out, uh, make sure to send me a link to it, and we'll get you booked to get you back on the show and, and talk about the, the new book. I sure appreciate that. Well, you take care now, and God bless you. All right. Thank you so much. All right, uh -huh. everybody, that's the end of the show for tonight, and we will be back next week with a, a very, very interesting guest for the month. Uh, March is going to be a great month for both shows, both Paranormal Connections and Aliens, UFOs, and beyond. We've got so much coming up that it's amazing. Plus, this month is my birthday, so on the 21st is my birthday, so we're going to be doing a little uh, pre-birthday celebrating the week before, so stick around and make sure to join us, and thank you so much for everybody for joining us each and every week, and all of those that join us in chat and our loyal listeners, thank you all so much, and very humbled, and I so appreciate all of you. We'll see you next week. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.